Grab a seat. It is another edition of the Pitch Stop here, presented by Pittsburgh Sports Now. I'm in a good mood. I'm hoping Mike is in a good mood. We just are off the heels of my favorite holiday, and that is Thanksgiving. And now it is the holiday season as we get towards Christmas and whatever else anybody may celebrate so mike how was before we get into the show because we're going to talk a lot of pit football here a lot of pit basketball even duquesne a little bit here pit got some decommitments we got to grade the season does the future look bright or maybe are some fans warranted to freak out a little bit and then what duquesne's doing what pit hoops are now doing and it's maybe a little better than last time we would have spoke to you but before we get to all that mike how was your thanksgiving give me your your favorite food item that was on the table for you well we, we had a uh we had a little ops a couple obstacles uh okay uh, we usually go to my in-laws house uh okay. for thanksgiving and the night before we got the call that uh, uh my wife's parents both got covid oh wow wow that is yeah a- yeah, that's so that kind of yeah. that kind of derailed. It's a three and a half hour ride, so kind of derailed things. So I had to call my brother up, who hosts okay. my family, and okay. ask him if he had room for five extra plates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so it's not just you; you have some kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So luckily he did, but uh, everything was good. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's tremendous. The 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 day after Thanksgiving is better than the. You could argue that, yeah. The day off, yeah. The the leftover turkey and the gravy. Yeah. I, I think I enjoy that more than the actual day of itself. Because the day of you you jump right into it and it uh yeah. I don't know, I make a pig of myself, but the, the, the next couple of days you get to spread you got it out to. a little bit. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. if you don't, you're not you're not doing it right. And I, yeah, you're I'm, yeah. I, I I'm sad to report that just yesterday, uh, I believe, as we record this now, the middle of the next week, I let it linger. But I now am I now have completed all the leftovers. My wife oh, did give cute. me the yeah she she gave me the the last the last call that hey you got to get these in now or that's going to be it and probably that that makes sense. Yeah, I think I finished. Wise. I think I finished the stuffing yesterday. No. Okay, yeah. Mashed potatoes, yeah, turkey, actually, stuffing. Oh, we yeah, had yeah, Sunday, I got it all done yesterday. Yeah, Sunday yeah. we, uh, our family, uh, in this household, we had a uh, uh, a second Thanksgiving. Oh well, I'm I'm impressed then. That yeah, you're yeah, really so doing Thanksgiving. Turkey, right? potatoes, yeah, so everything was uh, everything was good. Awesome. Yeah. Again, Mike Bakovic and Mike Mike Costi as Thanksgiving, unfortunately, behind us. It is the greatest holiday. It's about food, family, and football. And there's still a lot of football going on, some family holiday to celebrate and hopefully some food, but not what's on your Thanksgiving table. We can also listen to this podcast as well as watching, if you're watching right now, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn, etc. And Mike, Thanksgiving's over. And Pitt football's regular season is over. There will be a bowl game. This team did get in a bowl game. They didn't win the ACC again. They didn't win and defend their coastal crown, but a solid year nonetheless. And they will play in a bowl. A lot of speculation on what that game will be to this point. But there's some football ahead for the Pitt Panthers. A lot to worry about as well in terms of the future of the program. A lot of news in terms of decommitments. A lot of that's on Pittsburgh Sports Now right now that just happened a day ago and we'll get to that in a moment but before we get there how would you grade and evaluate this past 2022 season for Pitt because it's a polarizing season to say the least the bar was high they're coming off of the ACC title that some thought was kind of out of nowhere honestly they weren't predicted to do that prior to that season they had a great year they honestly were an upset or two away from really being a playoff contender last season. That's how great of a year it was. Kenny Pickett was a Heisman candidate. Again, got himself as the only QB to be drafted in the first round. He's on the Steelers. He's actually now playing well and improving himself on the Steelers with a recent win. So that was last. That was 2021. It all went really, really well. But Mark Whipple gone, Kenny Pickett gone, new OC, new team. Slovis comes aboard. It takes him a while to get his footing they lose a few more games than Pitt fans would want to lose. Some of them are bad losses. They don't vie for the division or the conference again, which Narduzzi said he wanted to make sure 2021 was not an aberration and they could do it again and build up the program for years to come. So the detractors can say it was a blip on the radar and it was an aberration. You could argue he's keeping it moving. 
how do you feel about the year? Because that really changed week to week with many pit fans. And now that it's over. Well, uh, if I gave it a grade, I, I think it's still under to be determined or it's yet to be determined. Uh, I think some of it will be depending on what they do in the bowl game. Um, right. Fair. As of right now, I would give it a peach bowl last year, obviously without Pickett. So getting a bowl win would be nice. Yeah. As of right now, I'd probably give it a B minus. Okay. Um, eight wins. I, I think if they win a bowl game, I would probably maybe depending on how they look, I'd probably give them a B. Uh, something that people have to remember, and I think it's a good thing, right. is that yeah, they you know they they were one win away. They beat North Carolina. They repeat as coastal division champions the way things played out. They, yeah, and that included a lot of teams had to give them help at the end. That it did end up happening. Yeah. Right. It, so the, the, you know they were one win away, and they're if they win, that's nine wins. Yeah. Now you could slice it up whatever way you want. Um, yeah, Georgia Tech lost. People would still be say then it should have been ten yeah. wins because obviously yeah, you could you slice it up. Them. Like I said, right. you could slice it up. Whatever you could dissect this, this, and whatever that. pie you want to have when you're talking. Yeah, about whatever <laughs> pie you know, peach, apple, uh, pumpkin. Right. Um, the bottom line is they had nine wins, and if you would have said years ago a nine win season, if anyone would give that a a C or a D. Sure. You think you think you'd be <laughs> talking about Alabama or Georgia here? And right. here's the other thing: if they win uh, their bowl game, yeah, they will they will have 20 wins in consecutive seasons uh, combined. That's hard to do. Seasons. That's hard to do. The last time they did that was 1982 to 83. Right. So so before we you know talk about how, how it was a disappointing season, yeah, things happen that you you didn't expect. But that's life. That's football. That that that, that happens. Yeah. But the end result is, if they finish with eight win, nine wins, nine wins is nine wins, and twenty wins in two seasons, it is a pretty good deal. Is it? <laughs> should they have beat Georgia Tech? Right. Probably. Louisville, yeah. they gave the game away. But the reason they weren't able to um, reach their goals this year is because of uh, because of the offense and, in more particular, turnovers. I, those two, I, those two right. things, and I'm not going to pin it entirely like the entire, you know, like most of the fan base will. Um, I'm not going to pin it entirely on the quarterback position. I'm going to say the offense because they're an offense. It's not, you know, the quarterback. It's the offense, and yeah. they didn't perform, and they turned the ball over, and that's why they, they didn't reach their goals. But I wouldn't call it like some people are. Uh, a disappointing or a failed season because I think that is uh, uh, I think that's a bit ridiculous. Yeah, and Narduzzi I don't know if he would say that but he probably does feel that a little bit in terms of disappointing because you come off winning the ACC and they feel I'm sure if they would have had Kenny Pickett no slight to him obviously he had the draft in front of him in the Peach Bowl they would have won that Narduzzi's been very public in saying that so he kind of mentally looks at it as a major bowl championship quality season last year it was and then to not get there again which is what the bar was that's disappointing but yeah. i think there's a difference between i think maybe fans should get this too mike i think there's a difference between disappointing and failure yeah i think sports fans and people in sports get kind of confused you can be disappointed you didn't achieve something because you feel like you should have achieved it. And this goes across the board for any program, any sport, any player. That doesn't mean you failed. TJ right. Watt, disappointed he didn't set the record by himself a season ago, certainly didn't fail when you end up tying it and you you miss a game or two for an example of a just an individual yeah. off a, a local athlete. So, yeah, I think Pitt's season, you could argue, is a disappointing season because – they didn't just fail to get their goals. They did lose in bad fashion in the main games. You mentioned Georgia Tech and Louisville. You win one of those. You're in a better situation, and you feel like you probably should have won both of those. Then you're really having a special yeah, if, they win, if they win one of those, they still don't win the AC. They still yeah, they, they win don't win the conference. They right, don't win right. The coastal, so right, you know, and that's that's what you got to do. And obviously, yeah. the coastal going away, but that the goal, goal was that was the goal the coastal and, and get back. And they didn't get there. But to say it's a bad year when you're looking at a chance for 20 wins, you're getting in a bowl game again. And you mentioned. 10 years ago or nine or 10 years ago, kind of in the beginning of Narduzzi, I honestly believe if you would have told Pitt fans four years ago 
that they would have back-to-back seasons with a chance of 20 wins or 20 wins in a couple years. They would have taken that all day. If you remember the beginning of last year, a lot of Pitt fans wanted to fire Narduzzi, and now you're looking to combine for 20 wins. So I do want to kind of ask you, though, because you alluded to this a little bit, you know, we can argue all day on the evaluation of the season. I think a B is a fair grade, but it didn't reach the end goal. And you mentioned the offense, you mentioned Slovis. So is it just that and the offense overall? Does that then go to the offensive coordinator, Frank Sinetti, that a lot of people are want to bring up, Frank Sinetti Jr.? Obviously, he took over for Mark Whipple. He also is the ire of many Pitt fans, in addition to the Slovis move not working out, but Slovis could be back. We talked about that before. So is it Frank Signetti? Is there something else going on? Did the defense let you down in some ways? Did Narduzzi make a decision? Was there some in-game decision that didn't work for you? They also did play a little sluggish against some teams that didn't have good years. If you point to the backyard brawl, almost losing to West Virginia and the Mountaineers miss a bowl. Where do you go blame-wise if it's a disappointing year, even though obviously the program isn't a failure for what they've achieved for a couple of years running now? When you talk about the, I, I think it, I, I think you break it up into different things, and I know that's okay. Then how would you pipe? That, that sounds like an easy way, and you know somebody wants, you yeah, know, everyone wants to point at one one particular person. It, it's not the case, and it's not a. You Can know, you give me a percentage a, break? Yeah, yeah. Then? It's not. It's not a wimp answer to say that. It, no, it, no. Team, uh, when they say it's a team thing, yeah. I thought I thought at the beginning of the season the offensive line was bad. I I I I I I maybe bad's the wrong word. They underperformed at what? Yeah. At the end of the season, they were what they uh, people were expecting. Their their play, and it shouldn't be surprising when you have five seniors up there for the most part. That's what you were expecting. Maybe if they would have got that at the beginning of the season, maybe things would have been different. Um, The Keaton Slovis. His play w- w- was the number one factor. He wasn't okay. what uh, people, the, yeah. what was advertised, what people were expecting you were going to get for him. Now, there were factors. I think there were parts of the sea. I think for the most part, aside from Jared Wayne, I thought his wide receivers uh, were below average all season. Every one of them, aside from Jared Wayne, he was an A. Uh, Mumfield, Means, um, Bradley, all of them. Uh, they they were average to below average, and they were expecting a lot more yeah. out of guys, particularly uh, Mumfield. He was a freshman All-American. People thought he was going to come in here and possibly replace uh, the statistics of Jordan Addison. That didn't happen. He didn't look like an explosive, explosive player all season. He looked okay. Him and Slovis didn't look like they were on the same page. Um, Slovis had a lot of bad turnovers. When I talked about the turnovers, bad. Louisville game, uh, Georgia Tech. They, 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 you know, you could blame the weather, but Georgia Tech also played in that weather in the <laughs> in, in, right. in the in, in the rainstorm. Yeah, uh, yeah. Same in North Carolina. I, I would say he was. Uh, you want a percentage? I would probably say he was sixty percent. Of the okay. problem, um, I, I and Frank Signetti is a it, it, it's a real interesting problem. Yeah, how much of a factor is Frank Signetti then? Because you could argue that maybe they didn't work well together, and obviously it's a first year for Frank Signetti. It's a first year for Slovis. Slovis had to learn a new offense, get chemistry with receivers. We talked about that before. It's easier said than done to do it that quickly, even in this transfer portal era, but. There are some that say he was kind of doomed before he started because Frank Zanetti runs a boring offense that's not at all what Kenny Pickett had. And if Pickett was still there, he would have been hampered too. See, I I, I, I hear that and I don't um I don't fall into that camp. Okay. I think Frank Signetti, I'm not in his head. I don't know. I think he was I think his play calling was dictated he by what he was seeing. I don't think he had faith in Keaton Slovis. He actually mentioned that a couple of times during the season. Okay. He didn't give Frank Signetti any reason to have faith in him as far as um, 
opening things up. There was nothing that Slovis was doing to tell an offensive coordinator, man, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to air gun this. Oh, we're going to be the Buffalo Bills. We're going <laughs> to, he, he did nothing to do that. So if you're, if you're, yeah. if you're a, an offensive coordinator, you'd be crazy to do that, especially when you have the best running back in football behind you. Yeah. So, right. I know it's easy, you know, boring Frank Signetti. Guess what? He made Israel Abanacanda a first round pick or not a first round pick. He made him an N- a high NFL draft pick. Yeah. He nobody saw running. that coming either. Right. Nobody saw that coming. There's nobody right. at the season right. was, was going to predict. Nobody. You, you give me, cite me somebody and I'll uh, sure. say I'm wrong. Nobody predicted a band of can that was going to have the year he dad had. So if you want to rip Frank Signetti for the boring offense, you got to give him, you got to be fair and give him credit for, uh, turning a band into a millionaire because that's what he's going to end up being yeah. because of this. Yeah. And if you're, if you're calling plays and you have a guy back there that's averaging six yards of carry and he has 21 rushing touchdowns, 12. you'd be a nut not to give him the ball, yeah. especially with what you're seeing out of your quarterback. The only and, we- and, and when weather is a factor, you mentioned in several of those games, weather was a factor. Yeah. yeah there, you know, uh, I just think he he didn't him and Slovis weren't on the same page. Yeah, uh, Slovis didn't do anything to give him faith. The only thing I will I, I will question Signetti about, and I still don't know. I still don't. It still is probably the biggest one of the biggest mysteries of this pit season, and hopefully it doesn't result in anything bad. But uh, when you when your quarterback is bad, below average, and he's not trusting his receivers. Why he didn't rely heavily on Gavin Bartholomew all year, um, who's a shorthanded a guy that shows he can do it. He's a mismatch for linebackers. That's like the you know that's a safety blanket for the quarterback. Throw it to your yeah. reliable tight end. I was going to say for whatever yeah, reason he never force fed the ball to uh, Gavin. Uh, he was uh, entirely underused. And I don't know the reason for that, but I, but unless there's a really good reason that I don't know, I'm not smart enough to figure out. That's the only thing that I'm really gonna uh, have take issue with Signetti about is is that the other stuff. I think it's all circumstantial, and um, I don't think he deserves as much criticism uh, as he get as he's getting. I think if he has a quarterback that plays competently you will see different play calling from Frank Signetti and things would have been different, but uh, nothing uh, allowed him to do that this year, which is why he called the games that he did. And it's easy to criticize because there's no way to know factually if that would have been the case because he was just dealing with the hand that was dealt to him. But that does make some sense. Obviously, if your quarterback's struggling or you go through a rough period, even early in a season. And again, to defend Slovis, it takes a while to get continuity with, with these receivers. And you also mentioned there were, I would say there the two main factors, a set, Everyone can bring up Slovis and Signetti and that they didn't work out together, whether it be Signetti didn't have confidence in Slovis because he was struggling or Slovis isn't as good as advertised in general. We maybe will see a lot of that moving ahead here in the future. They now have more years to work together, assuming that does occur. All of that we're going to find out, but everything you touched on is nail on the head. But separate from those two, the two things that didn't happen this year for Pitt that I think most people slam dunk wise thought we're going to happen everyone we had on this show to preview a season very close to the program said this is really really going to happen number one Pitt is going to have one of the better offensive lines in the entire country they did not they eventually had a really good one but it took a while to get going and yeah you can't say they were bad but they were supposed to be one of the better groups in the entire country and drive the bus and make it easier on Pitt with a new QB and a new o- offensive coordinator you do mention that i guess three things you do mention the tight end situation that everyone thought they would even use multiple tight end sets maybe one as a blocker one as a as a pass catcher be able to do curl routes maybe it's boring football but if you think signetti already was running boring football maybe you at least get the yards moving by get it to the tight end who then can do something if you have a pass catching tight end and you're doing it on the ground that can give you some passing in addition to the ground didn't happen and then the wide receivers were a disappointment I don't think it was fair to say anybody 
and nobody was, but nobody's going to say anybody should be what Jordan Addison was, obviously a Blitnikoff guy. But there, there were expectations just from what people saw in camp that I, I really don't think most of Pitt media, most of Pitt fans, most of the people that were close to the program, certainly that we talked to, were really that worried. I mean, you're going obviously losing Jordan Addison is a major hit. But from what we were hearing, people closer nationally, that was a conversation. Oh my God, what can Pitt do? Slovis doesn't get the weapon pick it had. There's not the major weapon there. This is a death nail. It ended up being a problem for sure. But people close to the program who were watching every day in camp, they thought, you know, honestly, yeah, you're not going to have the Blitnikoff guy, but it's not going to be a major deal. You're going to have more of a group. You might have a better group and somebody will step up. That just didn't happen. They, they, they were all wrong. So yeah. if, if, if those things don't end up materializing, you're going to have an issue. You think about it. You're a new QB learning a new system in a new city. Your receivers aren't nearly what they're supposed to be, and your offensive line is, is underachieving. That doesn't help you. That's not helping the cause. Uh, mm-hmm. By any means, and all that together led to some upsets. I think a B grade's fair. They did win a decent amount of games. Now, if they lose this bowl stretch, game, but yeah, if they lose it, this bowl game, that'll hurt. Does it matter who they play in the bowl minus, game that know, it is? We don't know plus. that yet. Yeah, B minus yeah. C plus. I want to point out one stat here. Great, uh, you you brought up the offensive line and uh, Chris Peak of uh, Panther Lair uh, had a great uh, stat yesterday to talk about how the offensive line progressed. This is pretty impressive. It's hard to evaluate for a casual fan, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Chris had this yesterday. He tweeted this out. Yeah. In the month of November, which Pitt went 4-0, and uh, by the way, they've gone 8-0 and the last two of Novembers, uh, so they finished strong. Pitt's running backs had 147 carries. They lost yards on just two of those times. Wow. And Keaton Slovis dropped back to pass. 111 times in uh, four games, he was sacked just twice. So if you add up those stats, that's 258 offensive plays in the month of November. They lost yards on just four of them. You you, you got to give thumbs up to the. That's a great yeah. stat by Chris, and sure. uh, you got to get you know that's that shows how the offensive line how well they played. Uh, for losing four just four. Um, yards and four plays out of 258 that's a pretty good uh that's a pretty good percentage yeah uh, to say the least and obviously that's much better than what it would have been at the beginning of the season obviously where sacks were an issue for Keenan Slovis yeah. going to that first game sacked I believe five times just off the top of my head so that really picked up at the end of the season and that certainly helped them get the year to be respectable but you got to finish strong especially when you don't win the Peach Bowl even though you think you would have with Pickett you, you, you do want to get a bowl victory and get some trophies in in, in the mantle there. So winning this bowl game, whatever it is, no matter who you play, I think would be a big deal for the future of the program. Mike Fakovic and Mike Osti, the pit stop here by Pittsburgh sports. Now, of course you can find us on this channel on PSN, head over to Pittsburgh sports now.com for all of our coverage. We are now let's get, into, let's get into the topic now that has the Panther yeah. fan base, uh, losing their minds over the last. I, uh, I will, there we go. So hours. now, now it's about the future of the program because no matter what we may think, this year's done. So no debate really matters. But the future of the program is what matters. You had about a day and a half that was just an onslaught. There, I saw it in the group text and then on the site of players decommitting. Which for a program that's about to win twenty games or could. That doesn't feel like a good vibe. This was a disappointing year, even though it wasn't necessarily a failure. They didn't reach their goals. And then you see this Max Exodus. That's just the case with the portal. But if you feel like the program is stabilized and in a good spot, you would assume that would lead players to want to stay and finish out there. And the players that are going to be transferring from schools, you would figure are from programs that got a lot of chaos or are losing. Pitt is a winning program now, and yet dealing with a lot of portal problems. Your thoughts, is it much ado about nothing? The players that did decide to decommit, how much of a, a, a hit will that be to the program? We've seen decommitments. We talked about Kenny Minchie as well in terms of decommitment at QB for the future of that position. They're going back into the well to try to find a QB now. But this season's behind Pitt. But Pat Narduzzi and company, they got a lot of work to make sure that they don't get blips on the radar for these last two years and keep this moving in terms of fixing the portal situation now and going back in into the recruiting uh, part of things. So 
your thoughts on, on this last week, but certainly this last day and a half decommitment wise and transfer portal wise. Well, in terms of the two guys that transferred, uh, uh, Jalen Barden and uh, Judson Tal- Talendier, those guys, for whatever reason, uh, you know, Talendier one year left, um, you know, that that's not that big of a deal. Uh, he was a veteran guy. He's going to look for a place that he's going to probably be able to start his last year. Uh, never understood what what the rub was or what why Jalen Barden didn't get on the field. He came to Pitt as a uh, pretty talented guy, uh, had speed, hands, good route running. Right. For whatever reason, um, I'm not going to speculate, but he was not able to get on the field his last year. And I don't know if there was a um, – rub with the coaching staff uh his position he was brought up as somebody that could step yeah, in. yeah people thought he was especially with the you know underachievement of some of the guys at the wide receiver position yeah. you think if some of the other guys aren't getting the job done let's move a guy in and see what he can do he was never given that opportunity and i don't know why uh those two aren't that big of a deal um the decommitments pit has lost seven seven players have who originally committed to pit uh for their class of 2023 have gone on to decommit um am i worried about it do i think it's bad for pit um i think there's a two separate am i worried about it no and i will say that for the reason of and it's going to be like this all the time and i know <laughs> pit fans are going to be s- solely focused on what is happening to their program and you can't have your blinders on this is football this will be football for the foreseeable future no team and i'll repeat ohio anyone no pete no team is going to uh be able to escape this it's just the way it is with the nil with uh everything else that goes on today Kids are going to commit. Kids are going to decommit. Programs are going to offer them better opportunities in terms of money, whatever. It's legal now, so it's not illegal. That's just the way it is. And if this was um, if this was uh, January or a couple of days away from signing day, maybe I'd be a little bit worried. But they have they have a month month and a half to figure this thing out and they will sure. and how sure. are they going to do that uh they've already started it uh there's going to be a bunch of coaching changes and they're going to be uh them like every other team west virginia same thing they've offered a couple guys from cincinnati that have uh in light of luke fickle leaving yeah you're going to see coaches leave programs then the second a coach leaves because kids are you know as much as i say well the program's winning so isn't this shocking kids don't necessarily as much as they may care about winning certainly when they're there kids go to programs for the coaching staff for the money for the situation to showcase themselves certainly top level recruits and top players but winning is a nice thing but if you're if your program's winning and you're not playing enough or your program is winning, but the coach that was showcasing you is gone, you're going to think about it, if not bolt, regardless. And now that's what you're seeing at Cincinnati. So yeah. a lot of schools, as you're noticing, are pluck are trying to pluck and throw offers at all those kids. Every every right program now. that goes every program that goes through a coaching change right now. Yeah, Auburn, Colorado. Every USF. every commit that they have, programs like Pitt and every other program. It's not right. just Pitt. They're going to be trying to pluck some players. And here's the other thing, Mike, it's going to happen. It's going to change, and it's changing. I don't know so much with West Virginia hoops, uh, not as as far as I can remember, but the transfer portal, and I feel bad for high school kids, the transfer portal is is having a huge impact on high school seniors. Programs are going to, like Pitt, uh, Jay, uh, Jeff Capel has done a great job of it so far uh, in terms of last year. Whatever position they need, instead of trying to go out and get some high school kid that might not be able to produce for them right. for a year or two, right? They're going to go out. They're going to go Fix out and go to a Power Five program or wherever and see yeah. and watch tape on a kid that's already done it, or at least has some film 
and they're going to be more comfortable going out and getting that guy. And that's going to, that's going to put together a team's recruiting class. A transfer portal is how things are going to uh, teams are going to be filling it up and look for Pitt to take advantage of that in a big way. That's how they're going to fill this thing up is by doing a split between getting, you know, some high school kids, but they're going to be going after kids and uh, kids that have transferred or looking to transfer. That's how it's going to happen. It's the new age college football. I hate it. I think it stinks, but it is what it is. And I just feel bad for the coaches. And this is no, and this is the other thing. I want to bring this up because I know I, Signetti, you know, he's getting blamed for all this. He's, he gets blamed for everything. It's cold outside. He really does get blamed for yeah, everything. It's, yeah, it's cold outside. So let's blame Frank right. Signetti for that. Right. Um, Narduzzi's getting ripped for losing all these guys. It has nothing to do with Pitt. Yeah. And no, coaches yeah. always do, too. You always bring it up. Well, this coach should be gone because he, yeah. lo- he lost this many players in a. Portal. Yeah, it has nothing to do with Pitt. I talked it's to Bryce good, Pollock. But- Right. who's a really good player. He decommitted from Pitt yesterday. I, who, I shouldn't say he's a really good player. He's a guy that I think could be a really good player right. in Pitt, especially in Pitt's defense. He's a 6'2 corner, perfect for Pitt's defense, press coverage. He de- he decommitted uh, yesterday. He's a guy that was uh, very uh, has been a, a Pitt commit for a while. He's getting inter- interest from an SEC program. I think it might be at Mississippi State. He's probably going to de- he, or he's probably going to sign there. It has nothing to do with Pitt didn't do anything wrong. It, it, it's not always somebody's. It's it just the way it is. Well, you mentioned Kenny Minchie with Notre Dame. Like yeah. it's Notre Dame. Yeah. Like you're you're going to listen to Notre Dame, right? Regardless of what you think about Pitt, that's just the case, right? Yeah. Do I do I think? Yeah, and that, that's just that's just the way the way the world now. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Education, you know, they, they both have it. Notre Dame's Notre Dame. But as far as playing, uh, yeah, do I think Minchie might look back and regret this? Yeah. Notre Dame's roster is filled with four and five star quarterbacks. And guess what? It's next harder. year, yeah. next year, you know what they're going to look to recruit? A four and five star quarterback. They're always bringing somebody in to replace you. If he goes to Pitt, there's a good chance that he plays for three years and he starts for three years. Notre Dame, it's a it's a year to year proposition. Yeah. You better you better excel, right? Because if you don't, those coaches are going to be looking to uh, they're bringing in kids in the recruiting class that are going to uh, replace you. So I think he would have athletically, I think he would have had a better opportunity and have a chance to make more of an impact at Pitt. But uh, you know, him and his family decided to go elsewhere, and uh, you know, best of luck to him. Yeah, and you got to respect these kids' decisions because because it's a hard decision now because you're you're really getting fed from all different angles now, and a, a commitment just doesn't mean what it was. The word is commitment, but everyone understands we might need to change the terminology because yeah, in the in the day of the transfer portal, it's it's a double edged sword, Mike. As you know, whether it be basketball, whether it be football, whether it be whatever, if it involves the portal, yes, it can be a problem that you can immediately lose a guy that you didn't think you're going to lose, or it can be a big hit to your program. Pitt did not factor in losing Jordan Addison when, when Kenny Pickett was going to go to the NFL. The, the day the season ended, they thought they were going to have Addison with Slovis or whoever was QB. That was a major, that was a major hit at the time. It was major news. And that was because of money. That's really what that right. was, yeah. but that's always going to be a thing. But at the same token, you mentioned West Virginia Pitt and players. I mean, what Bob Huggins got on the phone we got a story in WP Sports now. He literally called Perez from Manhattan, who was a veteran player who averaged 19 points a game. He called him 38 times and basically stalked the kid and said, "I'm not. I'm going to stop. I'm not going to stop calling you until you agree to come." He can't even play until conference play. Bob Huggins basically got a guy from the portal for like three months because he thinks he's that good and can do something now. And it's almost, it's like a pro team trying to bring right. on a, a trade in the middle of a season right. for a guy that's been sitting out. And it sounds insane. If, if Bob Huggins would never have done that 10 years ago, it sounds sacrilegious that he sold out, but he had to, that's the way of the world. I got pressure to win. Now you want to do this for a month and a half of basketball and it's legal more power to you. And I'll try to figure it out. So that's fan just ba- the yeah. fan Nelly bases Cummings with Pitt. I mean, yeah, it's the way of the world now. You got to adjust. Bases have to start realizing, and, and they can't overreact to this. Kids, this Every time day. of the year, yeah. I don't care if your team goes eleven and zero. 
you're going to have transfers, you're going to have decommits. It, it's you can't. It sucks right now for Pitt as far as what's happened in the last forty-eight hours. There's always going to be players available too. You, yeah, you'll lose you players. Evaluate, but you're not going to be able to evaluate. Players. Yeah, what happened and what their year looked like for recruiting. You're not going to be able to do that until February. You can happened. you can yell and scream and <laughs> you know call this guy a bum right now, but let things play out. Let's see who they bring in see who they sign, all that, then you can make some sort of evaluation. And, and then honestly, you might not be able to do that because at this time last year, everyone thought that everything was okay with Keaton Slovis. They brought a, they brought him in from the transfer portal. He's going to take care of the quarterback position. Didn't work out this year. I still think he could work out, but it didn't work out. So really you're going to have to wait in terms of the transfers. You're going to have to wait until the next season you, you got to wait until the end of the next season but yeah, yeah, yeah exactly even though when, when you no matter the program you may see you're losing guys but there's also always you can know this is a comfort gonna be guys out there that somebody else lost or just have to move on look at michigan they're gonna be a playoff team they had a quarterback battle at the beginning of the season the guy that everyone thought would win the battle didn't win the battle they won anyway in a different type of offense he's now in the portal that was a top qb that harbaugh thought was going to be leading him to the playoffs he didn't end up playing him and now he's in the portal so somebody else can get him so there's always going to be players available but yes you cannot evaluate until the next season because it would there's no way anyone can say the move to bring in slovis was a bad one in retrospect at that time because it wouldn't be fair. It's not worked out. You can say it's not worked out, but everybody and their brother was agreeing that that was a smart move. Mm -hmm. It was a great move. You got to do those things, and then it just didn't work out. You never know if things are going to work out. Uh, I do want to close up shop here, though, with some hoops talk because yeah. you did mention pit basketball and what they did in the portal this year, bringing Nellie Cummings and company, and Nellie Cummings finally starting to click, and we're seeing some – positive play from him it took him a while the pit team also starting to play a lot better than they were early on in the season even duquesne is making some waves right now so the city of pittsburgh has some successful basketball programs at least in terms of the last couple of weeks and we'll see how these seasons finish out and the pressure that's on certainly jeff capel and pit right now but they are playing a lot better what do you think of pit recently what do you think of Duquesne? What do you think of the chances of Duquesne actually having a year that that goes on throughout the whole season uh, of being successful rather than just these blips that happen every now and then? And can this can this continue? Uh, yeah, I think it can continue. Uh, I don't think the both conferences that they in, they're in, the ACC and A10, I don't think they're as strong as they have been in the past. And I think Pitts and both, I think uh, both respective programs are better. Uh, I thought it, I thought it was complete, and I tweeted it the day of. Uh, uh, I bet anyone in the world that uh, Duquesne isn't going to finish in last place in the A10. Uh, for them, the media to pick them in last place in the A10 this year was uh, ridiculous. And I said that the first day of the season, so it's not you know me tweeting yesterday after they're six and one. <laughs> right. uh, they, they had too much too much veteran talent. He brought in. Uh, the win over last night, which is a very good win over uh, UC Santa Barbara, which was picked to win their conference. Um, they've already surpassed or they've already surpassed or equaled their win total of last year. And we're still in November. Um, he has a good team. The only thing that could hurt them, uh, he needs to get some of his bigs back, uh, meaning uh, Duquesne. A couple of the guys are injured. Hopefully they're able to get back before conference play. And if they do, you know, they're at six wins now. I, I think Duquesne can finish in the upper half, uh, middle to upper half of the uh, Atlantic 10. And who knows? Uh, you know, I'm not going to predict this, but you get enough wins. Who knows? Maybe they'll get, maybe they're uh, and get some quality wins within the conference. Maybe they can qualify for the NIT. I, and I think that's, and I think that's the same thing for Pitt. Uh, Jeff Capel. Did. That'd be a big deal. I think for either Huge program deal. would be a, would be a major deal this Huge year. Pitt deal. obviously has been struggling even to get conference wins the last few years. It's been really rough with Capel. A lot of expectations on a couple years ago. Last year, no expectations really. They weren't supposed to do anything, and they didn't. But now expectations are there. And you, we talked about the portal for ten minutes. That's why these teams are able to be so much better so quickly. So they took advantage of it. It can work both ways. 
Yeah, Duquesne. Their their entire really start, Duquesne. Yeah, Duquesne. Their entire starting lineup is comprised of uh, transfers. Yeah, every every single player in their roster is a transfer. And Jeff Capel did a, a tremendous job this year of getting uh, not only transfers but quality veteran transfers. And uh, the thing that separates this pit team from the last. A uh, couple years. The game the other day against Northwestern, it's the best game that I've seen Pitt play. Um, I can't even name uh, a game uh, as far as their all-around play. They looked uh, – Really under the radar game, though, because it was during Monday Night Yeah, Football. Monday Night Football. The Pitt Pittsburgh fun. media wasn't even hardly doing yeah. anything with it, except we did have coverage to Pittsburgh Sports now. But, yeah, it was very it, under it the was, radar. It, it, it was something that fans were just shocked at what they saw, the, the crispness of the offense, yeah. their shooting, uh, the de- everything about it, it. It just looked like, who the hell – who are we watching here? It, it was yeah. It was crazy how well they played. And – the, the biggest the two biggest things that Jeff Capel did this offseason and uh, it was brought it was brought up but you know you have to actually do it on the court you can't just talk is he brought in guys that can shoot and shoot threes uh, for Pitt to beat Northwestern by o- almost 30 points and for John Hughley to put up zero points in that game that would have never happened no. if Joe if John Hig uh, Hughley scores less than 10 points <laughs> right all the betting odds are pit there's zero chance for them to win he scored zero points the other day and pit uh ran northwestern out of the barn because that's- they have shooters they have veteran shooters guys that can fill it up and that's the difference between this pit team uh and teams in the past the only problem is when you rely that much on the three-point shot if it's not going in you know, you could be in some problems, but as of right now, uh, they have three, four guys that can, uh, they're deadly from outside and John Hughley is nowhere close to being in shape or, uh, back to where he needs to be from the knee injury. Once he does, this could be a, uh, pretty good team in the ACC. Yeah. And I also think, and this is what I heard from a lot of people that cover Pitt, and it makes tons of sense when you look at this roster. Not only did Jeff Capel bring in guys from the portal to help this team now, which any coach has to do. He had he has pressure to do it now, at least have an improvement season, or or his butt might be on the line. But he also brought in guys that fit for a team. Nelly Cummings is a perfect team guy. He is a quintessential point guard that can really lead the offense it took him a while to really get going but even if you don't see 20 plus points from him if you see a 10 and 8 game from him that could still mean he's really leading the offense they had more shooters than ever before you obviously have ugly down low who even if he's not scoring zero points and his team still won big it's because he can still get rebounds and help the offense without getting points on the board those things didn't occur in past seasons especially last year when it felt like it was just five guys out there they didn't play together it didn't make any sense they didn't really fit their roles these guys now fit roles and also to be fair to Pitt, mike because they are now winning recently i know they had the loss to vcu People are going to point to the backyard brawl was kind of embarrassing for the program with the fans there and then losing so bad it's possible and nobody wants to hear this and you still got to focus on your program it's possible they played a damn good west virginia team that you just saw what west virginia did in portland in in the PK-85, where they basically have been beating everybody except for Purdue, who is a top five team in the country right now. So, yeah, that looks bad when you lose to your rival by that many points and you get run out of a gym that's your home court. But maybe you lost to a tournament team. I mean, you know, who, who, who that that's yeah, a good they, team. No, they, so, they've they won the games they're supposed to win. Right. And – and those other games, they didn't have their best play. That's not an excuse. And Hughley didn't play. That's another yeah, Hughley, thing. Yeah, Hughley didn't play. 100%. And in those games that they lost, um, they can't afford to get in foul trouble. And Nellie Cummings uh, yeah. and Blake Hinson, two of the best players on their team, they both missed most of the first half because of uh, the two or three fouls. So when you're, when you're without Hughley, with your, with, you're without your only point guard – and you're without, uh, to that point, have been their best offensive player in Henson. Um, you know, what you yeah, Nelly Cummings, I was covering it. He fouled out of the backyard brawl with seven minutes left in the second yeah. half. 
Yeah, and then they missed the uh, uh, Capo had to sit him uh, yeah. in the first half because, uh, because he barely of, played, so, right? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm sure if they played again late in the season, It'd be uh, West probably. Virginia would probably still win. But I, I, I would fairly confident that they wouldn't win by that the score that they had uh, the other, you know, when they played in the first time. Pitt will be, right. you know, it says, you know, it's always the case. The teams can be better or should be better late in the season. But uh, yeah, I, I think things are. Uh, some Pitt fans are cautiously optimistic. I don't think they want to put. That's the phrase. Yet. Cautiously optimistic. Yeah, That's yeah, cautiously, yeah they, they don't want to have faith yet in what's right. going on. Uh, you know, they're going to be tested the next two games. Friday night, they play a pretty good North Carolina State team. And then they, say, play, they play Vanderbilt. So I think if they could split those two games, uh, I, I think pitch fans should be uh, happy with uh, the beginning uh, month of the season. Yeah, and then after that, you have a couple games that should be wins for Pitt. So you have the opportunity, if you split those two games, to be able to stack some more wins. And it is all about wins in college basketball, even though it's also about resume. And then you do get into Syracuse, North Carolina, Virginia, Clemson. So you get in the heartbeat of the of the conference schedule and NC State being there. So, yeah, you're going to you're gonna have a rough road coming up, but there are some winnable games in the middle there. So there's there's definitely a chance to win more games than last year to show a significant improvement, maybe make a run at a chance at an NIT. Uh, th- and NIT would be a big deal for a program that uh, hasn't both, really been spent in respectability for a few years. For both programs, for sure. Yeah, yeah. certainly Pitt with Cape, a lot of pressure there. But even for Duquesne, that would be a major deal. It would Huge. be a major deal. Yeah. And there's a lot of programs that you see success where they get to the NIT, and then you see the next year where it really takes them further. Then you're looking at NCAA tournament success. And with the portal, you can do things a lot quicker. So I guess that's kind of the theme of this particular show, that, yeah, you got to watch the portal. The portal can be a problem and can certainly hurt you. It also can help you. So Pitt football, they're losing players in the portal despite – a solid two-year stretch here of winning, even though this was a little bit disappointing and didn't get to where they wanted. But you can certainly fix it really, really quick. You never know if a player is going to work out or not, even if everybody loves the move like Slovis. And then Pitt basketball and even Duquesne, a perfect example, even West Virginia throughout our network, that you can go off a really bad season where everyone's really, really down. They wanted to, There was fans who wanted to fire Huggins, and then now he, he basically put a whole starting five together from the portal. So <laughs> you can quickly go to the portal – that's why this knee-jerk reaction that we live in this 24-7, 24-second <laughs> news cycle that we're in now, it doesn't really work in college sports with the portal because the people that matter are not sweating it out when these kids choose to decommit or, or, or leave because of the portal because they know they can go back in and replace them. It is easier said than done, but there are examples of it happening when people yeah, did give not another think example. Was uh, give another example and we can close with this one. Um Speaking of the portal, um, Duquesne, not a lot of people, uh, you know, obviously their viewership is, uh, they need to start winning in order for people to get a lot of interest. Yeah, it's not a major program, right? However, uh, if you're talking about uh, talent, I I believe, and I, you know, I'm sure I'll hear from Pitt fans about this, but um I believe they have the best play. If you're talking about the best player in the city this year, as far as most talented player in Pittsburgh, um, I think it's Day Day Grant, their guard. They got from Miami of Ohio. Okay. The kid is uh, ridiculously good. Um, He had like 26 or 28 last night. He's averaging 21 points a game this year. Uh, four straight games, four or five straight games with 20 points. First time a Duquesne player has done that since Micah Mason. Uh, <laughs> yeah. This kid is big time. Uh, if he was at any other program, um, he was a good player at Miami of Ohio. And uh, Keith Dambrot and his staff uh, targeted him. They, they knew of him being from Ohio and the recruiting they do, they do in Ohio. Uh, they knew there was an opportunity to get him. Um, he's the best player Duquesne's had in a while. Uh, and you know, I'm not going to say he's a pro player might be, uh, really good. If you get a chance to check Duquesne out, um, either in person or on TV, just check him out. He is a special player uh, and, um, you know, Pitt has some nice players. Uh, day day grant is, I think without a question, uh, the best player in Pittsburgh this year. And he's probably been the best, uh, best player in Pittsburgh 
uh, maybe in a couple of years. He's that good. Yeah, Pitt fans would probably bring up Ugly um, in he's terms of better. overall ability, yeah. but they're different players. They're totally they're different, different, players. Yeah, they're different style man. players. Right. You're looking at a big man who can get rebounds. even. Yeah, but this guy, he can shooter. do it all. His right. defensive play, his three-point shooting, the way he's able to get to the rim, uh, defend. There isn't a thing he can do, and he has size. And to be able to defend while you're scoring that much, because as you know, even at the pro level, you put up 26, you're usually not even, no one even cares if you defend, it seems. So if he can defend and wants to defend, wants to defend is almost just as important. That, that that's a major deal, and that's got to yeah, give give credit to Keith Dambrod. He, he's he's very known, obviously in Ohio. A man coached LeBron at the beginning of his career. Yeah, he's a six two, six three point guard. That's the other thing too. You're, you know, he I guess he plays uh, two guard for Duquesne because you know they brought yeah. in another guy who's really good, uh, Tevin Brewer from uh, I believe it was Florida Atlantic or Florida International, one of those Florida schools. Uh, you know, he had the appendectomy at the beginning of the season, and now he's finally healthy. So they have a really good. They have one of the better backcourts in the uh, Atlantic 10 with Brewer and Grant. So that's yeah. that's the reason why Duquesne is going to be able to compete is because they have veteran, talented players in their backcourt. And if you have two guards that can play uh, and they're experienced in college basketball, it gives your team a chance. And uh, Duquesne has that this year, and which is you know, a yeah. big reason why they're 6-1. and one. And especially if you can, if you have shooters, because if you can shoot, you can shoot. Doesn't matter what names on your jersey or where it's happening. Right. If you can shoot, you can shoot, and that's how you get a major upset in in March Madness right. or maybe a team making an NIT appearance or beyond that you never would expect because it's hard to gauge things and predict things. So yeah, feather in the cap to Keith Dan brought really underrated coach in the whole country, honestly, uh, and to be able to turn it around based on going the portal because. He's another one of those that I know there were a lot of fans thinking, well, he's going to be resistant to doing this because he's older. He's been around. This is annoying to him. You sneeze the wrong way. Kid's bolting. Does he want to deal with that? Well, he jumped in and he jumped in and did really, really well to this point. And I also had a sales pitch. You mentioned watch it or listen to it whenever it's on somewhere and there's different you know apps, et cetera, et cetera that you can watch some Duquesne or listen to Duquesne on the radio. But if you can get down there, get down there. A really, really nice place for a program of that level to be playing in. They got the facilities to say the very best. Yeah, I'm going to check it out next. Yeah. Uh, I was checking out their schedule. Next Thursday, they have a really good game against coming up against uh, Marshall. Okay. Uh, I believe Marshall's 5-1 and one or 6-1 and one right now. Uh, Duquesne should win on Saturday against uh, Ball State. So they should go into that game with a uh, with a record of 7-1. and one, And Marshall always has a good program. So that will be a uh, – it should be a fairly uh, – uh, entertaining game at the uh, Cooper Fieldhouse next uh, next Thursday. I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe I'll try to check it out as well. Yeah, that, I got some hookups there to Kane. But uh, all right, that'll do it for this edition of the show. We wanted to speak to you here after Thanksgiving. Obviously, a lot more to talk about as we get towards other holidays, and of course, that means a lot of news on and off the field, both football and basketball that that we'll experience here, to say the very, very least. For Mike Pekovic and I'm Mike Osti again. This was The Pit Stop, presented by Pittsburgh Sports Now. Catch us, download, subscribe, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, etc., as well as here on our channel of Pittsburgh Sports Live and Pittsburgh Sports Now, so hit that subscribe button at the bottom. No more Thanksgiving leftovers, unfortunately, but a lot of football and basketball and a lot of things to keep tabs on. So we're busy as I get to drown my sorrows nonetheless, but uh, a lot of of positive and, and, and good meals ahead either way.